sponsored by the Dunleary Rattown Local Enterprise Office. You're listening to Business Eye on Dublin South FM. And welcome everybody. Yes, Friday it is April. The frost seems to be lifting from this wonderful country of ours and the sun is shining and it brings out a little bit of smile in everybody's face. You know, Simon's happy working away in his garden. You know, every week he gives me a rundown and I'm getting jealous because I need to get out into my garden as well. I'm not going to say that word. I refuse to say that word this week, the one that begins with L, but no. Simon, how are you? How is everything this week? I'm good. I'm good. And I think we're heading towards the middle of the year and we're coming out of a dark period and we're coming into lighter times. And I'm hearing we might even be able to get a haircut next month, Joe. Is that right? Well, I'm doing haircuts at the moment, if you want. You know, I've I got my... my You're doing nixers. Yeah, I'm doing nixers. I'm doing nixers, yes. I'm making a pig's ear of it, as you can see at the back of my head. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I'm learning the trade, learning the trade on it. The sun is coming out, the days are getting longer. So yeah, it's, look, it is, a, it is what it is, and it's going to be a wonderful summer. We just have to hold faith and believe and know that the only thing that's going to get us through this, as I said to you before we started, pure love. Exactly. Who have we got, Simon? Who have we got today? Well, talking of love, we've got two really wonderful guests. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. And you're going to have to control everything here, Joe. I can relax and just watch it all, that the dynamics unfold. So first up, we have Susanna Healy. Uh, Susanna is a psychologist, a mindfulness meditation wellness trainer, She's a speaker. She's also an author of uh, you know, various things. One book I can see behind her, The Seven Day Soul, Finding Meaning Between the Noise, really talking about the relevance of spirituality to health and well-being, which is close to my heart and your heart and all of our hearts. So welcome, Susanna. It's great to see you. Thank you. Lovely to see you both, too. Great to be with you. Good to have you here. And then secondly, somebody I know very, very well, uh, Sheila Ukurahan. And uh, Sheila is a former teacher, and she is blossomed out into somebody who's doing some amazing work, uh, inclu- including having her own radio show over in the States, which we won't say any more about, but she's doing wonderful work. She's a success strategist, educator, uh, a psychotherapist, a podcast host, host, and the guru's guru. And I'm looking forward to doing some work with Sheila as well. She's going to do some work on me. So welcome, Sheila. Well, Mila, my God. It's just great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to see you. So, Joe, over to you. Relax. (laughs) Relax. We put the feet up, get the coffee going. So, yes, you know, as we are all going through this wonderful world as that we live in, and there is a a lot of talk about a lot of people working and a lot of people, not everyone, everyone's working from home. And there's there's a lot to do with work-life balance. But in my belief as well, I think that's something inner, an inner spark has to happen with everybody as well. You know, there's, we are looking outside of this world and looking at all these material things and all these issues that we see online or in the news. And I think people need to really draw back and focus within because within is where the answer holds. So I'm going to open this up to Susanna and just following on from that, what, what's your, your thoughts on, on the statement that I've just made? Well, you know, Joe, it just what popped out of me, out from what you were just saying there about that's what within is from where it must hold. And Iris Murdoch has a great phrase, you know, the center must hold. And it is so true. I think today we have such a focus on the external. And, you know, it's, a, you know, and even our sense of progress is, you know, if you Google images of progress or whatever, it's all kind of upward arrows and there's no lateral progress. There's no breath. We're not developing breath. We're all supposed to be upward. And, you know, it, it's to do with how we are seen in the world and what, we're, what we what we do in the world. And yet our value and our worth doesn't come from what we do in the world. It certainly comes from contribution. But we exist we have value simply because we exist. We have value simply because we exist. And that is the lesson that is getting missed everywhere, I think. And so that center, that inner uh, depth is what is being missed, I think, in education and in business as well. And yet there's this boom in in um, research around spirituality in management, and it really is kind of the next frontier. Um, we've done much better at kind of getting, talking about mental health in the workplace 
and out and about. And um, I remember when I first started out uh, going to to businesses, kind of saying, you know, we've got to be looking at mental, people's mental health. And they said, are you kidding me? We're not their mother. And it's none of our business kind of thing. Whereas now look where we've got to. And we need to develop the same maturity with spiritual and inner health, whatever spirituality must, might be to somebody. So Perfect. that's centered on the mm. yeah. And Sheila? Yes, well, as you say, Susanna, lovely to chat with you. We had a brief chat in advance of this uh, engagement online, and I'd say there are so many synergies in what we both do. So as you say, spirituality is a different thing. Well, the practice of one's spirituality differs from one individual to another. But I think where we are all one is in that we are all seeking a wholeness from within and it is from within without and as within without so once we can get our basic emotional needs met in life and that has to happen from within we have a sense of heart coherence which can then invite a sense of brain coherence and when we have heart coherence and brain coherence we really have infinite potential so as you say joe i would firmly believe and i would concur that health and wellness does begin within and whilst we can get meaning and purpose from that which we do for others by giving, um, we still need to be able to self-regulate and find that sense of self from within. Because Bruce Lipton speaks about, you know, connecting the heart and the head together. And we talk about the epigenetics. Genetics. And if we focus on health, the genetics kicks in and it actually increases our immune system by just just focusing on gratitude helps our immune system. On it. For so, sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Your IgA, your immune system literally downregulates when you're in survival mode. So when you're throwing off a stress hormone incessantly and you are in a worry cycle and you find it very difficult to come out of that state of being, your immune system literally downregulates because that's not the time to repair mm -hmm. your hardware. It's the time from your ancestral neural pathway to get out of there. And it's your body doing a good thing for you. Your body will break down in various parts and places, um, perhaps into a state of chronic ailment when your immune system is not able to work at its very best. And that can happen because you're in stress. There's the whole area of vulnerability as well. There's a place in India where and you can Google this, where you know old um, sick Indians went to, to pass away, basically. It's like a hospice. And they were asked... What were the things they regretted most in the in life, and what came out top was I wish I'd asked for more help in life, and so that really is visceral when you hear that. And so, and then we we all like seeing we like seeing people being vulnerable. We like their honest vulnerability. We like to see it in others, but we can't stand demonstrating it in ourselves. Maybe Susanna first. What is it about? What is it about society that? forces us to block that expression of vulnerability that makes us think we need to block our own sense of vulnerability what is that yeah i, I think you are so right because i know I, I, it's something that i say in workshops a lot we were talking about mental health and sometimes i'm doing the um, managers workshops and it's kind of you know everybody's really kind of yeah what, what do i do to help somebody and how do i be the listening ear and i say it starts with your vulnerability and it starts before crisis stage, if at all possible. Um, so it starts by showing if somebody kind of says, you see, we kind of tend to hold, we have societal values and we, you know, it's almost like, are you busy? Yeah, I am, because you, you're supposed to be always busy. That's a, a societal value that we have. Um, and it's almost like, you know, that dictates where you are in the pecking order. It must mean you're very important if you're really busy. Um, and that drips down into what you feel you can say or not say. So what if, but so I always encourage people to say, do you know something? It isn't always about being the listening ear. It's about being honest about your own vulnerability. It's all great for our ego to be the listening ear, but we have to admit our own vulnerabilities and our own difficulties. And if you start with the little things, then people find it much easier to, you, felt, you, you, you sound much more human and approachable when other people want to speak to you. Yeah. And Sheila, when, when, when is it? When do we start blocking this expression of vulnerability? Is it during childhood? Is it because we pick up on anxiety, so we think we just need to close ranks? Or when does that start happening? I can imagine it probably begins after about the age of seven, because between naught and seven, by all accounts, children are still in a the theta space. So their brain, it's never a chocolate, it's never a mud pie. It's always a chocolate cake, for example, you know, between naught and seven. And you need to know that. And they're very adamant about that. So they're in that lovely space of creating their 
imagination and modeling what they see is how they learn. And then post seven, children learn, have to begin to learn how to learn in a totally different way. So at that stage, they need learning is the firing together of neurons. And in order for them to hardwire, they need to maintain and sustain by repetition. So it's a totally different learning style. And within that, then I think people become conscious of themselves because that's consciousness is awareness. And so you're aware of what you're doing and you're aware that you may not do it well. And I think in those very early years, um, the tendency to self-doubt can become prevalent for young children, in which case they like to hide their vulnerability. It's a, so again, I think it probably is ancestral. It's a survival instinct, you know, uh, what pro, what that which probably grows into imposter syndrome at a later stage, if not addressed. And I do think there's a lot to be said for the healthiness and um, I suppose the productivity and effectiveness of the mother-child dyad father-child dyad and parent-child triad. Um, I know that parents will always do their very best with the wisdom and knowledge they have at the time, but you, you know, we're, we're all parents and, and we're educators and, and we've been parented. But to a, lot, a large extent, some of us have to reparent at a later stage when we learn about vulnerability and we have to forgive um, and we have to move on and, and grow from the lessons that we were afforded in our past rather than bring them with us because it, it just continues to pull us down. So mm. learning the, the, I suppose, the power of being OK with our vulnerability, I think, Simon, is really key then to growth and development at a later stage. Yeah, yeah I would agree. Like, Susanna, what you're saying there about the, you know, we have to learn to say no. And that's one of the things that we need to teach our children is to actually say no. Um, and accept to ask for help because we have this shield up that if you if you ask for help you are a failure you are you are not part of society and we have to teach people it is okay to put your hand up and ask for help and when you do that there is release there is a freedom there is an expression in oneself that goes I'm okay now and the tension of those shoulders at the back will be released and then when when we're talking about into seven year old up to that age, the child is always still there. The child never disappears within their own subconscious. We just lock it away in a box and bring this, as you said, this new imposter syndrome that comes in. And we have to teach people to be childlike, to be still that free spirit child that they once were, because that in itself is liberating. And when people express that and see that, Everything else sort of changes with them. And that, as the world it is today, the one thing that I've noticed, which has been taken away from everybody, and I've said this on multiple shows, is laughter and joy and connection. Sure. And they are the three things that I believe, and correct me if, if, if you agree or disagree on this, that can, that can heal, that can heal the world of the situation that is in, in today. Um, sure. I agree, yeah, yeah. Joe. People are are very traumatized. There's um, just by life in general, the uncertainty, we'll say, of the last couple of years, not to mention just the uncertainty of growing up for everybody. But our brains are pattern matching agents. We do better when we notice the schema. So if we have a pattern laid down for something, we do better. And we may not excel immediately, but at least we, ide we can identify where we're at with something when there is a pattern laid down that we can recognize and identify. And I think these uncertain times um, can be particularly troubling for people who hadn't necessarily set down the, the power skills in advance of this just by virtue of how their life had been panning out for them in order to be able to, to cope with these very uncertain and um, heretofore unprecedented times. And I think there's, um, there's a lot to be said for the lack of quality exchange of attention between people. So a basic emotional need that we have is a quality exchange of attention in balance. So not too much attention for any one thing and not too much attention from you to one other or from one other to you, but a quality exchange of attention allows you to grow into the best of yourself. And unfortunately, in the last couple of years in particular, we haven't had the physical opportunity for that. So I think people are feeling a dearth of that human contact and they're lonely. Loneliness is very toxic. It's a toxic Toxic environment in its own right. Well, what about on honesty um, in, in terms of self-reflection and self-awareness and, and alignment? There's a really powerful book, probably my favorite book, called Into the Magic Shop by an American neurosurgeon called James Doty. And it's a true 
true story and he's he's operating on brains right it's quite graphic and then he reflects back as a kid and he walked into a shop in california and he said if you come back every every day for six weeks i'll teach you magic and what she really taught him was the the essential importance of getting honest with yourself right uh, and you know when you're aligned you instinctively know what to do and you know deep down you're on the right path right and i've been through that journey and i know joe has and sheila and i, I believe you have susanna what can we do as four people to assure people that that's the right thing to do, to really dig deep and not be afraid of going through that alignment, alignment journey? Susanna? I think it is um, tapped into what we were talking about earlier in, in, in terms of that vulnerability and humility. We have to set up a paradigm. We, we have to realize we, are, we, we do not see the world through a, a lovely, clean lens or uh, you know through a window as it were a keen glass we're always looking through a lens our our, our culture our families have a lens on the world our culture our, our nations and, and so on and so forth so we've got all these lenses and biases that are on the world so we're never seeing things as they are even just teaching our children that in whatever age appropriate language we use that we have all of these biases that we have a lens on the world we're seeing it one way through our experiences our age our family or our personality type etc that allows you to realize oh i've got a lens i wonder what's outside that lens because as soon as there's a lens now you want to know more so it comes from teaching people we have a lens we have a, a view it is not what we see as reality or fact is a view. Stephen Covey had a great phrase in this. He kind of said, you know, um, a lot of people uh, just to paraphrase really badly. But, to, you know, he said everybody, you know, thinks oh, everybody. What is it? They, they don't hold the, their viewpoint. Their viewpoint holds them great phrase of teaching ourselves to realize we have a view of the world and when you do that, then you can begin to actually then you, you, you excite people and you can say, oh, what are the other ways of seeing the world? Uh, and, and, and humility and vulnerability are values. Are, are they? So because at the moment in society, it isn't fashionable to show humility. It's kind of be out there, be all you can be, build yourself up. And it's all about persona building. And again, going back to instead of the inner work. Yeah. Sure. And we don't yeah. tend to, and, and of course, we can't see the world as it is. We can only see the world as we are. So it then depends on your own narrative. So there's a great strength in realizing that we can actually tell ourselves a different story because in a lot of cases, we acquire a story based on the circumstances of our lives. And when we just don't pay attention to that, looking through a particular lens, as you say, Susanna, uh, perhaps sometimes you need help with that. It's, it's good to have a good therapist on hand to guide you in imagery and use your right brain to help you to use your imagination, which is a fantastic innate resource. It's an emotional GPS that you can use to get beyond the narrative you've been telling yourself, which might have been holding you back and tell yourself a different story. And within there's so much power to change the way you're living your life and to live intentionally rather than living out of operating systems, living reflexively and not paying any attention because that's where the trouble is. That's when you trip up. So um, a lovely analogy, Suzanne. I love that where you're looking through a lens and then you can change that lens and change your viewpoint. Mm. Truth. It's the courage to find and speak the truth. And the only way that you can do that is trust. And for me, it's understanding that trust in divine or trust in spirituality or whatever it may be to put that foot forward. And that is the biggest fear that people have, that if they step forward and speak of what they believe without anger, but and everybody can have, it, have their own opinion, but everyone live to get on, even if it's a right or wrong opinion. But it's truth in speaking that. And when you get to that level, I think it's, it's a liberation. It really is. You are free. You have that expression on it. And I was speaking to Greg Braden there a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this as well. Um, and we, I was saying to him that I believe that what's happening at the moment in the world, that we're having, it's an evolution of the mind at the moment. With all that's what's going on, that people now are changing. But I think that the world is shifting for a better place. And there's two things in the, in the world now today that's doing this that could never happen. I would never be able to do this. We would ever in history before. One is the internet because it's bringing us all together. And I believe also COVID is allowing 
people to wake up and really discover themselves as well. So with those two elements, I think we're going through a massive shift. And I think it's a spiritual awakening as well. To call it what you want, new age, whatever, a divine. But I think people are starting to really look and see and experience, hopefully, of who they are. Do both of you believe that we are going through a shift of an evolution or are we just kicking the can oh, around? Absolutely, here? I believe it. I, I, as Simon mentioned, I'm working with uh, Voice America and on the intro to my podcast, every time I talk about uh, COVID being an opportunity guised as um, a hopeless situation, because I do believe it's a great awakening. And I do believe that we're definitely going to engage in regrowth through the lens of our future rather than getting stuck. I, I think it's a fant- I, I choose to see it as a fantastic time and a great opportunity. And as T.S. Eliot would say, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all that are exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the very first time. That encapsulates the COVID opportunity for me. I, I agree, Sheila. I think it is this um, wonderful existential turning point, um, you know, our opportunity. Now, I do not want to belittle the horrors and the suffering that some people are going through. I have been incredibly blessed. And so it has been lovely and nurturing. And, you know, it's just a time of actually just coming back down to the most important things in life. However, for other people, it is quite literally struggling to survive. And I think that needs to be given recognition. Um, I think that is really, really important. I do think, Joe, the uh, internet can be both. It, it is this wonderful way of sharing ideas, um, but it can also, it can obviously be used in a, in a kind of a bullying way and our way of saying, this is the fashionable way of thinking. And as soon as, I always kind of say to my children, as soon as you're thinking exactly the same as everybody in the room, take a moment, just question yourself, step back. Are you just being biased because of, because you want to belong to the group that it feels comfortable to do that. It feels much safer to do that. Just come back and be careful of mobs and groups and whatever. And remember to think clearly for yourself. You're so much more powerful remembering your own individuality in that way. And you can contribute more to the greater good if you just remember to, to everybody using their own thought to, to make sure we contribute lots of different ways of thinking. I think when the printing press came along as well, people were having the same conversations. Words have power. Words really have power. Simon, we'll uh, we'll take a quick break, break. And when we come back, I would like to ask our wonderful guests, how do we incorporate all this teaching into our daily life? Sponsored by the Dunleary Rattown Local Enterprise Office. You're listening to Business Eye on Dublin South FM. And welcome back again, Business Eye, sponsored by Don Leary Rathdown Local Enterprise Office. And we're talking about love and ethics and gen- you know, and vulnerability and honest. And we'll get on to businesses in a second. But Joe, you, 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 you wanted to talk about how you think we can all apply some of what we've discussed really to, I, I guess, to push our own growth journey. Myself, this has been a long journey. And every year I have more ha-ha moments. And as time goes on, personally, myself, I and so I mean, you know me a long time now, I don't get stressed, I don't get worried, I don't suffer from any of that. And that was because I had to realize that every, every action has a consequence. And understanding more from how I live my daily life, I believe it's a ripple effect and other people will see that as well. So there's a, the reason why I asked that question, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, are suffering or worried or fearful and believe that there is a spiritual awakening going on in the world as well. It, this might sound a bit cliche, but for me, I'm trying to discover how Christ, Yeshua, would live his life and how I can see if I can live my, uh, my life of 40% the way of he could. I've never said that before on radio, but that's where my evolution is going as a human being. And I wanted to see how, how everyone here is also their own spirituality, their own belief systems, how they're incorporating that into their own daily lives as well, without righteous, righteous. You know something, it's really a hard one. And I know that uh, just, um, I, in my book, I, I talk about, well, how can we actually 
get there because I think we all I think we do have to become very conscious that's the first step is to become conscious to become aware of what we're doing or on kind of usually on autopilot and very habitually um, and then it does take effort because it, it's the same as going to the gym you have to practice something until it becomes habituated and it becomes those neurons connect and it becomes more automated. And the same goes for, for certain kind of values or, or, or whatever that we need to practice them. So I kind of I talk about in the book that it isn't really we all think we're we all tend to grade ourselves as above average on an awful lot of things, be it being good drivers or whatever it might be. And but we do it's it's we need to do more than just kind of say, yes, I'm a kind person. I believe in kindness. I believe in love. We actually have to practice it quite consciously because the growth doesn't happen when I'm loving about a total stranger and I wish them well very generally. The growth happens when somebody who's irritating me or I don't, but you know, whatever it might be, I'm really struggling with them to actually say, ask another question. I don't feel like elongating the conversation. Ask another question. Say something that's kind. Say something that's flattering. Pause. Don't say, bite my tongue when I want to say something nasty. That's where growth happens. So I talk in the book about seven pillars of practicing and just kind of suggest as one way of doing it is practicing, you know, awe, humor, forgiveness, generosity, gratitude, patience and stillness and taking one of those each day as a pillar and looking for opportunities to practice them. That's just one way of doing it. But we do have to do it consciously because the growth happens when it hurts, you know. It's like going to the gym, it hurts. <laughs> Absolutely. Agreed, Susanna. It's like, a, it's like a bicep curl for your brain. When you need to change gear neurologically, you you know, reps are there. But every now and then you do need to up the weights if you want to see a change in the shape of your arms when you're training in the gym. Similarly, when you're hoping to change your behavioral practice, it's a really good idea, as you say, to become metacognitive. So to be the observer of your thinking rather than getting stuck in your thinking because you can't change the problem from whence the problem hails. So when you can even sometimes just take your thoughts and put them on paper or chat with somebody about them, or as you say, have the courage and confidence to ask for help. Sometimes you don't even know how to pose your question. It's just enough to be able to say, I'm stuck. Or somebody said to me last week, and I, and I was actually a family member, and I was I felt quite honoured. Um, as I did, I have to say, Joe, when you said this was your first time to uh, chat about something like this in a radio space, I always feel it's a lovely honour to be along with somebody when they have one of those emancipating moments, because it's a great it's a great sharing of uh, Don't worry uh, about it, I'm going to edit it out. You are not going to get away with it. We'll we'll keep talking to the end. We'll weave it in. We'll weave it in on you so you don't get to take it out. Uh, Yeah, but, um, oh, I'm cast out from the tribe again. You're doing this. You guys are bullying me. That happened in the beginning as well. (laughs) But note how I got back in. Got back in. I I do think there's um, so much to be said, though, for the capacity to be aware, Susanna. You're so right there. Because in your awareness, um, you're not being reflexive because when you're in the known it's it's odd but that that tight um fist that bud that you're in is safe for a while and then it becomes not safe to stay in that tight bud space you need to open up and blossom and you have to get into the unknown to do that and that's a little bit scary it's a it's the paradigm leap um but it's also a threshold and every threshold has great potential if you allow it to have so So i I see I, I agree. And, you know, you, you mentioned something you don't mention before on radio, and I, I'm happy to say this, that and I've written about it, that you, you, we all come into the world with nothing and we all leave with, leave with mm. nothing. And in 2009, I assumed I had nothing. I assumed I'd lost everything. Right. And people can read about this elsewhere. And so in that moment, for just under two months, I assumed I had nothing left. Right. Nothing left. And yet looking back, it wasn't that bad. It really wasn't that bad. I do remember laughing a lot hysterically with people I I was with. And what came out of that point was um, that for me, it's about willingness, right? I need, I've realized that there's nobody out there who's going to save me. Only I can save me. Number one, I do believe in a higher power. Number two, it's about open-mindedness. If I have contempt prior to investigation, I'm doomed. So you and I, you know, you and I talk about COVID and Joe, you have strong views about things, probably stronger than me. Not because I, do, not because I'm weak. It's because I don't know, right? And so I'm not being contentious either side. And the third thing, most important thing for me, is honesty. And I mean, I'm a human being, so it's impossible to be 100% honest, right? We all lie every day to a greater lesser extent to ourselves. 
but I try my hardest. And so for me, it's moving from that comfort zone through a fear zone that I was at in to a learning zone and now a growth zone. And I, for me, it, I have to break it down that way. So, yeah, Do you know what I, I put it down to for my next TEDx talk? Zen to zero. We walk in this spiritual, you know, we try to do this wonderful thing and we're in Zen. And like that, we can change to zero. The kids scream, you go, ah, oh, the dog barks or something happens and we, we knock back. And on the, the, then the laundry. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, you, yeah. something yeah. borns or whatever. So it's Zen to zero. And, and it's learning the, what the distance is and catching yourself between the Zen and the zero. So it doesn't happen instantly. It's a slow movement and you stop yourself before you get to that zero. And that is the teachings that I'm trying to learn and develop myself. Mm, That's amazing, Joe. I talk about APET, so activating agent, pattern match, emotion and thought. That's a human givens practice. So you can, if you were to jot down the letters A-P-E-T and pop a hand over one, you can see ape and then pop a hand on the other side, you can see pet. So you can turn your brain from an ape to a pet in a nanosecond when you learn the practice of noticing the activating agent. So this is what you're talking about. What's the one thing that brings you from then to zero? And then notice the pattern match because our brains will pattern match. They'll say, oh, this is like, and invariably because of the negative bias, we'll pick a thing for the this is like example, something that wasn't good, that didn't serve us. And we'll begin to feel those feelings as if it's happening again. Then we have an emotion. But that's where the power is, because if you can name the animal, catch that emotion, name it, what happens is you can go from the emotion that you're feeling to a more managed thought. And then the action serves you because you're in your place of power. You're, you know, you're getting the control and the autonomy over those emotions before they get you. So using your mind, because otherwise your mind will use you. Right. What, what what about businesses? Now, we haven't got into businesses. And, and I was talking to Joe before. I've interviewed a guy from California called Moshe Engelberg, and he's written an amazing book called The Amare Wave, A-M-A-R-E, which is Latin for love. And he studied businesses, and he believes there is a place for, of, for love in businesses, right? And we don't often talk about love and business together. What do you both – maybe I'll start with you, Sheila – I mean, businesses talk about ethics and values, and a lot of it is rubbish. I'm just going to say that, right? And some businesses really try. But at a deeper level, is there a place for love and the the characteristics of love within business? There absolutely is, Simon. And you're the first person that I ever heard actually talking about that. And I was intrigued and inspired. Um, and excuse the, the gender bias I'm now going to express because it was a male that was saying it as well. And we, you and I chatted then offline after said conversation, said interview about that because I felt that it was so interesting that you could tally the two, you that does so much work in business and you have such a success rate and you are the growth strategist and you can help businesses to close their deals, make their millions, but they can do it by respecting the people. And it is the people that decide um, the culture. And so therefore people are feeling better in themselves and they're getting their meaning and purpose because there's love in the room. I absolutely feel that business will thrive and excel because there's a sense of love and a sense of respect for people and uh, quality inclusion, not just integration in business. I I think it's the only way. Mm. Susanna. Susanna, I think, um, you know, absolutely. I I, I love Latin, so I love going back to the, the, the Latin words, but, you know, I, I talk about also agape and that unconditional love, the Greek word. And, you know, love, love can be seen like a very fluffy term. And, you know, the, you know the, when people talk about soft skills and it drives me mad. I mean, this is rock foundations of it's as important as gravity and air is absolutely fundamental so i hate the fluffy image that people sometimes have of these of these things it's so fundamental to our existence um but but love isn't just a, a vague concept you can kind of when, when you apply it into the workplace you, you know you bring it down into its kind of more singular threads as it were into discernment forgiveness um acceptance now they're not easy again they are 
practices. And we, you know, we do, we, we can't just throw out the phrase practice. We, it literally means we have to practice it again, going back to what I was saying earlier. So there's many, many um, disciplines or threads within love. And conditional love is, is hard. Is it, it is to do when things are challenging. Um, and it is to do it, you know, so it is those conversations when you kind of say, well, things like servant leadership and that kind of thing and, and leading alongside as opposed to, again, changing the view of how we view a leadership to be allowing other people to grow. Now, in order to do that, the organizational system needs to adapt because if you, you have to, the organization and the hierarchy needs to reward people who bring other people up. And at the moment, most organizations don't do that. It is about, you know, get yourself, you know, ahead of the game. Whereas the more you can actually say, I, 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 you know, we're actually rewarding people who let other people fly, then you really change the, the, the hierarchy of the system. You're spot on because when we, when we Seven Summit came back on and started doing the show in January, we've been speaking to a lot of people over the last couple of months. And the one thing that I'm noticing, which everyone is speaking out about, is leadership. And there seems to be, and even when you're on LinkedIn and social, you're speaking to people, there seems to be a concern about real leadership in the world at the moment. You're talking about organizations. How do organizations lead? And I think, you know, if we went into an organization and you start talking about spirituality and so on about all this, they, they switch off. It's power. The conversation is, how do I gain my power back? How do I be the person that I want to be? So do we start, you know, and I do it subtly all the time when I'm speaking to organizations or I'm coaching people. It's subtly just getting people to take back their own power. Coming out of this, when we come out of lockdown and, and just when Simon said to me, you know, my views on COVID, it's not my views really on COVID, it's my views on lockdown, but it's, the leaders, the people that need to lead, need to stand up without fear and speak their voice for their community, which is their organization. What do you think as a leader in an organization should be saying to their staff in this moment of time? Well, I think um, I'm prompted to say that I think you can be strong and be compassionate. Mm, yeah. um, I think that you can struggle authenticity and sensitivity with marketing and advertising or with whatever is your product or your brand. I think it's possible to be a really good leader as long as you're not managing. I think as long as you bring people on to be the best of themselves, make room for the emerging leaders. Don't set up a ring of fire. You know, make sure that there's always room for that somebody who has heretofore been quiet and, and hasn't presented to perhaps find that that is the day that they're going to make their contribution. And maybe all they needed was to be heard and to be seen. And they can change the quality of the product and perhaps make more money for the company. So I think leadership, obviously there isn't any one thing that I could suggest any leader could be saying, but I, I could suggest though, that I think it's extremely important that there's, um, that there's room for all and that there is a voice given to all because I think no one person can bring any company on to fruition. It is always a team effort and yeah. together everyone achieves more. Yeah, and, and I think it gives great meaning to everybody because I always believe that we are responsible for the people who's, who cross our paths in life, no matter who that might be in the shop, wherever we, we are, we're responsible for how our, our interaction with them. Um, and that gives fantastic meaning, I think. Um, I think responsibility, there's so much talk about rights and we've needed that, but we do need to counterbalance it with responsibility and responsibility really enriches us. It's great to feel I have a responsibility because that gives every one of us a role. Um, and, and even when I'm talking in companies and I do think, Joe, people are getting a little bit better and braver about talking about spirituality. I often when I'm going into companies, 
I'll say, listen, if you don't want me to mention that word, okay, or I'll say existential health or something like that. And then when they get to know me, they're much more kind of, okay, that's not scary. Yeah. It's not too out there or anything like that. And they be much more comfortable. Um, but I, I think when you actually empower everybody to realize that we are all, you know, when we're talking about suicide prevention and that kind of thing, and people saying, you know, it, they won't necessarily, somebody who's struggling may not go to a manager. We're all responsible for looking out for each other, for giving each other value and worth um and and um how we how we treat each other um and it's just that gives us all power and strength and it means everybody's everybody's a manager in some way i'm wondering if it's an occupational hazard for a leader if they're not in you know professional development training all the time about their position and the importance of their role to perhaps forget and just think that they're doing their very best. I wonder, should we bring that um, sort of lost leader with us sometimes when we have complaints from the back row and just say, look, you know, can we have a chat? I think sometimes it's very important to remember that everybody, including the leader, could be um, in a place of unconscious incompetence, you know, and hoping to get to conscious, unconscious competence. Everybody should have a coach. Everybody should. You know, that yeah, can be a counsellor, a friend, whatever. Everybody should, no matter who you are. You know, I always wondered about, the, the. you know, everyone should have a coach and he's one coach is talking to A and then the next one is talking to B and it's a circle and it's going right back. So it's just probably the same 10 people. So the guy at the bottom of the business is probably talking to someone who's sharing that information and it, it's just a circle going on. So, yeah, I think everyone should. Simon, yourself, what are your mm. own thoughts? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm following this through. You know, for me, love is not weakness, right? It's it, for me the outward manifest, manifestation of love is calm, compassionate, courageous communication. Okay, in other words, it's assertive communication. What I mean by that is aggressive communication isn't love based, but also passive communication. We might think it's okay, but if you're communicating passively, the chances are you're not going to get what you want and you're going to feel resentment eventually, right? So for me, the key is if we're all as assertive as we can be, and assertive is being forceful in what you want, need, or think, but in a way that's respectful of others, that kind of closes the loop. If every human being on this planet were assertive, right, not aggressive and not a passive, I think... I think the level of awareness would just naturally, the tide of awareness would rise. So for me, it's about calm, compassionate, courageous community. I think, Simon, though, we also have to allow unknowing. Um, I totally agree with you in terms of assertiveness and just a, a completely, a, a, a absolutely, just kind of treating others as you would like to be treated. So you voice your opinions in a way that would defend you if they were to do it the same way. I think that's a, uh, you know, absolutely. Um, but also... There are times when I'm going to be assertive because I'm not sure somebody else in the room may have more expertise or whatever it might be. And I'm happy to just not know and, uh, you know, uh, and be in that space as well. And I think that's, I don't think, uh, not that you weren't saying that, but I think some people mistake it, don't they, for being assertive for loudness. And that's no, not I agree. what the you're saying. Communication yeah. comes after the self-awareness. So if you haven't built that sufficient self-awareness, don't say it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. The, the so one true. question, yeah. I think the one question that every leader should ask before they make a decision in anything is instead of when making decision, what is in it, in it for me, myself and I, but asking the question, what is in this for the greater good? That could be of the people involved, the organization, whatever. Take them themselves out of it because every decision that we do make is about it's about ourselves. But if you are making that decision, taking you out of the equation within the organization, amazing stuff can happen because you're doing it. It's more balanced. It's more balanced. On it. Where can people uh, reach out to to locate or find you your website? So. Who wants to go first? Okay, so I'm. Uh, you can contact me on LinkedIn and on the Human Givens homepage. So I have a page on the Human Givens homepage. I'm a Human Givens practitioner, and um, I post regularly on LinkedIn. 
And you could find me at SusannaHealy.com, but I think 7daysoul.com is easier to spell. It's all the same website. So 7daysoul.com. I'm also on Facebook, uh, Susanna Healy author, uh, LinkedIn. Simon. I thought that was a great chat. And, you know, we, we covered so much around vulnerability and love and assertiveness and communication and judgment and and I think companies really are struggling now. They're looking to be more inclusive and more cohesive, and they really don't know what the future is going to be. And I guess one question I put out there is, what should companies look like in 2030? Maybe just think about that. You know, there's a lot of churn in the world, and there's a lot of change. What should companies look like in 2025? Mm-hmm. And that's it, folks. Another week on Business Eye with myself and my super, super co-host, Simon. Simon, I'm looking forward to getting up and helping you with that garden and lifting all that stuff and having that barbecue. Having that the piano, the piano on your back. The, the piano on my back. That's it. Sponsored by the Dunleary Rattown Local Enterprise Office. You're listening to Business Eye on Dublin South FM. Yes, folks. And my next guest, um, I asked to come on the radio because they've created a Facebook page called Faith Freedom Ireland, and it seems to be growing in popularity. The person that I'm speaking to is Cass Sunshine. Cass, hi, and how are you? Hi, thanks for having me on. I'm grand, thanks. Good, good. Cass, the reason why I'm having you on, as you heard there, it's because of the Facebook uh, page that you created. And I wanted to ask you, two questions and the first question I want to ask you is why did you create it why did I create it that's a great question so um I created Faith Freedom Island on Facebook and on YouTube um back in October 2020 and it initially started with a petition um that received thousands of signatures over a space of a couple days and the petition was um a call on the government to remove restrictions regarding the prohibition of public worship. And at the time, it was uh, government guidance, uh, advisory measures to close places of worship. But subsequent to that, a few weeks later, we saw various statutory instruments being introduced that made public worship a criminal offence. And so since October 2020, if you went to church for a public worship service, if you went to mosque, if you went to uh, a synagogue, wherever your place of worship was and you observed your faith publicly, you could be fined or imprisoned. And um, I really felt that that was just uh, so disproportionate and um, a step too far. I think during the past year, people have compromised on an awful lot in their lives. And I felt that uh, forcing people to compromise on their religious freedom without any scientific basis when we have uh, a human, a God-given and a constitutional right to practice our faith, um, I I wasn't going to sit down and and take that one lightly. So that's why I created the Facebook page. So people who shared my sentiments, we could all connect and we could come together from all different walks of life, not just Christians, uh, because even though I'm a Bible believing Christian myself, I believe that every human being has the right to practice their faith openly and without fear of persecution. That's true. And the next question then I have, what is the mood of the people that you're speaking to? How how are people taking this? And oh, since October, what's been happening? Yeah, so um, quite a bit has been happening from different denominations of Christianity. There's been various letters and meetings uh, between the Taoiseach and the archbishops. Um, we've also seen uh, the Church of Ireland be involved. We've seen non-denominational Christian churches uh, from Christian Voice Ireland Um, Their most recent letter was signed by, I believe, 220 pastors requesting scientific basis on which the government asserts churches must be closed and uh, the government refused to provide them with any scientific data. So it just goes to show you that the government really did not place any value whatsoever on people's spiritual well-being. Um, And people at this stage have had enough. And 
if I'm being perfectly honest, I I think that people have come to a stage now where whether the government puts uh, further restrictions and more severe penalties in place or not, people are just going to start going to their church or their place of worship. I think they've reached a stage now where this cannot continue and they are seeing their, their mental health really suffering, their spiritual well-being really suffering. And I think that's an area of people's lives that has been really neglected the past year. And people need that part of community back. That's a part of our human being that really needs to be nurtured and um, it's it's dying and it's unnecessary. So people are coming together at this stage. Uh, There have been lots of different churches who have been meeting in secret. I myself have been going to church throughout this whole um, prohibition. I'm aware that's a criminal offence. I'm aware that I could be fined. I'm aware that I could go to jail. Um, and quite frankly, I don't care. Um, I really think at this stage I have to put my God before men and I'm really unapologetic about that. I think what I found that coming up to what was the Easter was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and a lot of people that I've been speaking to, they were saying, you know, what's going on here? You know, we can all go to Aldi or we go to Dunn's or Tesco's. But we can go to a place which is quite large and, you know, a church, which then could have people socially distance in it, which churches are big air space places, but we're refused unless people would go to a church and they would go to a coffee shop. Let's be honest about mm-hmm. that. But and it was it, it was more people were saying it was more like this was a rule and people that that were enforcing these rules on us have no spiritual faith and are more interested in state than church. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? Um, I can't speak on behalf of anyone else, but in my personal opinion, I definitely think that Ireland is no longer a country of saints and scholars. Um, I I don't think people hold religion in the regard that it should be held in any longer. And I think that's a real shame because um, for the for the most part, religion gives people hope. It builds communities. It has been um, something that has brought people through some really, really dark times, particularly over the past year. And I think we've seen gradually, um, particularly over the past four, five, six years, um, a lot of people would feel that our nation as a whole is not reflecting a culture that is cohesive to honouring God. Well, one of the things as well, I always say, there's no such thing as an atheist on a sinking ship. And a lot of people, what's happening now within over the last year, are waking up and finding a spirituality. Um, it, you know, it doesn't matter what what faith that you have or once they are finding this spiritual connection with with God, source, divine, whatever you may want to call it. But what I noticed as well, that when these were like we were locked down through Easter, there was people who were, you know, in their 70s who have followed all the guidelines, wore masks, locked in, kind of said, no, I'm, I'm done with this. This is rubbish open the churches do we just have to go and stand by our priests and say enough is enough um yeah i think now we've reached a stage that in order to be um spiritually obedient we may have to resort to civil disobedience um i'm a person that believes in peaceful action but action nonetheless And I feel that when religious communities have made such great efforts to implement recommendations in terms of social distancing and so on and so forth, um, when such great efforts have been made to communicate to the government the damage shutting down spiritual places of worship has done to so many people in this country, um, the government doesn't care. So we need to take care of one another. And I think one of the main ways that we do that 
is that we open our places of worship and we honor our God and we honor one another by practicing our faith in a peaceful, but nevertheless proactive way. And if that means we go to prison for it, well, that's the price that I'm willing to pay, but I can only speak for myself on that one. (laughs) Well, you know, the more discontinuous people are saying to me, this is more like communism than anything. You know, this whole, as we know, the Archbishop spoke about it, about the new world order. But I think in the in the long run, I think people will, are more awakening up and this will change because our faith is more and more precious than anything that we have. That and our family, the family unit on it. Cass, again, if someone wants to join this Facebook page or, you know, um, get connected, where just give us the name of it again. So you can find us on YouTube and on Facebook and the page is called Faith Freedom Island. Everyone, look, have a super weekend. Have an awesome weekend. Be safe and look after yourself. And we'll talk to you again. Take care. God bless.